So, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about whale sharks this evening. Well, it's this evening in the UK, anyway. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be talking about some work I did a couple of years ago. Um, and the kind of premise of this talk is about tracking whale sharks using biological passports. And I'll go through what that is um, as we go through the presentation. So I'll also, uh, Jenny did a really lovely uh, sort of introduction about MMF, um, but I thought I'd just tell you a bit about myself before I get started. So I've been working um, at the Marine Megafauna Foundation for about 10 years now. Um, and I've, um, I did my PhD in the UK at the University of Southampton. So the stuff I'm gonna be talking about today is some of the work that I did uh, for my PhD. Um, I do normally live in Tofu <laughs> in Mozambique, but uh, like a lot of people, uh, I ended up getting uh, stuck somewhere. I got stuck in the UK uh, instead of going home. Um, so this is where I normally live. Um, uh, I've been so privileged in the time that I've been working with MMF, um, as well as enjoying uh, all of the field work. Uh, I've been able to go to some amazing destinations and um, that's led to me being quite interested in underwater photography as well as all the sciencey stuff that, that goes with it. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy some of the photos in the presentation. They're mostly, mostly mine and a few of them are uh, Dr. Simon Pierce's or Dr. Chris Rona's. Um, we all take a whole bunch of photos of whale sharks and so I hope you enjoy them even if you uh, end up uh, glazing over for a few minutes <laughs> during the presentation. So um, I'm going to kick off. I know some of you may already know a whole lot about whale sharks and you might have even heard one of us do a talk before. But for those of you who maybe don't know so much about whale sharks um, and also to give a little bit of context to some of the work I'm going to be talking out, I'm just going to um, just give a little bit of an overview. So like the title suggests, uh, whale sharks are the some really, really big animals. They are the biggest fish in the ocean, and they're actually most likely to be the biggest fish that's ever lived. They are very, very enormous animals. Um, but controversially, uh, they are actually really, really hard to find. Um, even since they've been formally identified in just the early 1800s, um, all the way from then up till about 1980, only 320 encounters in all all that time got recorded. Um, and even Jacques Cousteau, with all of his wandering and traveling around the world, uh, only ever saw three whale sharks in his wine swilling lifetime. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons is about the why, about where whale sharks choose to live. So whale sharks are actually very, uh, they really enjoy tropical waters. We generally find them uh, in waters between about 27 and 30 degrees is their preferable, preferential temperature they like to be in, which works out to be mostly around the equator. And if you look at the uh, lovely colorful map on the screen, this is a map of global ocean productivity. So all the warmer waters are actually in the pink and purple and blue areas. And those are actually areas of very, very low productivity. And for a giant megaplanktor, that's a really difficult environment to live in. They're very large and they do need to consume um, a lot of food to keep themselves going. Um, so what that means is they have to spend quite a lot of time and have a really good strategy at moving through this environment to find enough food to keep themselves going. Um, whale sharks mostly feed on plankton. They are the largest planktivore. Um, the only other two planktivores, planktivorous sharks, are uh, the sort of temperate basking shark and the elusive deep sea uh, megamouth sharks. And the areas that whale sharks, we usually find them, are actually uh, areas of really high productivity, um, areas of usually uh, seasonal uh, abundances of food. Um, and whale sharks are quite solitary animals normally. They, they don't hang out in family groups like uh, some marine mammals. Um, so really, most of the time when we see them, uh, I'll just play this video for you. Uh, most of the time when we see them, they when they come together 
together for these really, really big feeding aggregations in usually in coastal areas and usually uh, sort of seasonally and quite predictable uh, seasonal aggregations in these coastal regions. Uh, when there's food around, when there's productivity, um, the whale sharks will gather in very, very large numbers to take advantage of uh, this abundance of food. Um, the aerial shot here was from uh, Mexico and they, I did an aerial uh, sort of census and they got, I think one time, over 800 sharks in, in a single day in, in one aggregation, which is pretty impressive. And because of this sort of seasonal aggregations in these, you know, predictable places, uh, quite a lot of tourism has built up around these areas. Um, and also quite a lot of research has built up around these areas. So including tofu and a few other areas that we work in. So most of the information that we have about whale sharks has, has come from these coastal aggregation sites. Uh, when we know they're going to be around, they're in big numbers, and we can collect a huge amount of information and data about the sharks during this time. Um, but like I said, these are only seasonal aggregations, and, and the whale sharks only spend perhaps a few weeks and maybe up to a few months of year in these areas. And then for the rest of the time, we're really not sure what they do. They will swim, swim away from these coastal areas, um, and it's usually and it's very hard for us to find out what they're doing uh, with the rest of their time but it's it's incredibly important uh, when you're looking at conservation management strategies to to know what the whale sharks are doing all of the time so what they do in their the entire uh, in their entire habitat uh, and through the, the extent of their range we need to know what they're doing most of the time so that we can uh, protect them and one of the, uh, uh, and, and, and also we want to know the, the connectivity. Uh, we know where these certain aggregation spots are and we know whale sharks turn up there, um, but we really don't know very much about how all of these different sites are connected to each other as well. Um, and this can become very, very important as well to know the connectivity between these sites when we're trying to look at management, uh, when we're trying to put in protected areas, and even when we're looking at things potentially uh, like local extinctions, we, we need to know whether two areas are connected to, to know whether we're likely to get an influx of new sharks to replenish the, the population in that area, or whether we're looking just at a full on extinction from that area. And at the moment, um, the, the figure that you're looking at is a genuine uh, published figure in a scientific journal. Uh, so this shows you really how little we know about whale shark connectivity uh, globally. Um, quite a lot of the information we have so far, um, and I'm sure some of you will have heard about this, uh, uh, usually we put electronic tags on the whale sharks to track their movements. So when we, when we see the sharks, we'll put a satellite tag or an acoustic tag on these animals so that we can get an idea of where they go and what they're doing when they move away uh, from these aggregation areas so we can keep tabs on, on what they're doing. And we've managed to get uh, quite a lot of amazing data on horizontal and vertical movements of whale sharks in, in most of the aggregation, whale shark aggregations across the world. Um, but there are downsides to using this kind of technology. Um, first of all, uh, it's extremely expensive. Um, one satellite tag will cost you upwards of about $5,000. Um, the ocean also is a very, very harsh place <laughs> for electronic equipment. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you try and put an electrical item on a fish and send it out to sea. Um, equally, uh, things can happen. The, the tag can fall out. Uh, we've had a few tags in places be eaten by other sharks. So you can spend a huge amount of money on these tags and then uh, have it you know, fall off the shark within a matter of hours and then you'll have absolutely no data whatsoever and you'll be several thousand dollars down. Um, it is a really great technique, but um, we, because of the expense and because of the lack of guarantee that you'll get good data back, um, really what we're looking for is some other ways of trying to complement this data so that you can maybe fill in fill in some of the blanks about what whale sharks are doing. Um, for example, 
we put the tags on when they're at these coastal aggregation sites, but uh, we have no idea what they've been doing before they arrived. Um, and so we've thought about uh, some of a few different ways which we can come up with to have a look at what may have been happening before they arrived and also to perhaps get some long term data on, on what these whale sharks are doing. So the study sites that we mostly focused on, uh, I think you'll be not surprised to see Tofu Mozambique in there. And one of the other main study sites that we, uh, we spend our time at is Mafia Island in Tanzania. And in this study as well, we included uh, the Al Shaheen oil field in Qatar. We have some uh, excellent collaborators who uh, worked up in, in Qatar. And we focused on the Western Indian Ocean mostly because it's where we work, um, but also because uh, whale sharks are, are an endangered species and they are the uh, population declines have been particularly bad in the Western Indian Ocean. So it's um, reasonably uh, urgent that we find out um, a lot more about the connectivity and movements of the sharks in this area. So those are our uh, three main study sites. And so what I'm going to go through is just a couple of ways which we we're going to use the natural markings of the whale sharks and the natural biochemistry of the whale sharks tissues to help us figure out a little bit more about what they're getting up to when we're not uh, when we're not seeing them. And some of you might have noticed that I dropped the word biochemistry in there. So with a really sneaky title, I have sucked you into a biochemistry talk. Don't worry about it. I'm going to walk you through this um, and I'm going to do it at the beginning so that so that we'll get we'll get it through while you're still with me. Um, I'm going to steal a uh, or sorry utilize I'm going to utilize uh, a lovely cartoon that my PhD supervisor used to actually illustrate um, another paper that a colleague of mine uh, published a few years ago but I'm mostly going to uh, concentrate on the first two or three uh, two or three boxes in that cartoon so um, what we really want to do is figure out a little bit more about the whale sharks movements um, and like it says in the cartoon globally shark populations are declining and as i mentioned whale sharks are not exempt from that um, but what we want to do is figure out what, where they're moving um, where, where they're moving at large sort of long-term and large-scale movements as well but like i mentioned tracking sharks across the open ocean is ex extremely difficult so We've turned to biochemistry uh, as a kind of forensic tool uh, to look into uh, where the whale sharks are going. And the first technique I'm going to go through is called stable isotope analysis. And so the, the premise of this is based on uh, GCSE chemistry for those who are from the UK. Don't worry, I'm so sorry to put a table up like this, but I'll go through it. Um, I don't know if you remember this, having some horrible flashbacks from school, um, but this is a periodic table. And if you remember on the periodic table, all of the elements have uh, an elemental weight. So I've put up carbon and nitrogen here because these are the two elements that we mainly use to look at movements in the marine environment. And naturally, you get carbon 12 and uh, nitrogen 14. This is the naturally occurring elements, but there are also slightly heavier versions or isotopes of these two elements that also naturally occur in the environment. Um, however, they are in much, much, much smaller proportions, usually about 1% uh, compared to their slightly lighter counterparts. And the ratios of these two heavy and light isotopes, um, they naturally vary in the environment. Um, and that's mostly because of the uh, differentiating, differentiating metabolic processes that go on in photosynthesis. So because they're heavier and lighter isotopes, the way they go through chemical reactions will be slightly different. Um, and effectively what that does is means that we get naturally occurring differences or ratios all across the globe. So this is an image of uh, roughly what the uh, sort of isotopes or we call this because it's a map we call this an ice escape so this is an ice escape of carbon and without really worrying about the values too much you can see that in 
the equatorial regions, we've got a completely different value to when you go to the polar regions. There's a real latitudinal uh, gradient as you go across the, the uh, as you go across the oceans, and this means it's extremely useful to us uh, because these natural variations in in these ratios. Um, actually gets passed through the food chain. So it starts with the plankton and it will get passed through the food, food web all the way up to our sharks. Um, and it will manifest in the tissues of the sharks. Um, so it'll be a reflection, the, the ratios in their tissues will be a reflection of where and what they were eating. So um, this is kind of a how usually how it works. So um, usually you'll get the plankton at the bottom of the food chain, and as you go up, you get predictable changes in how the carbon and nitrogen ratio ratios change. And this is kind of what a typical food web would look like. And this is a biplot. This is kind of how we would uh, represent this data uh, normally. But you can see that we, you can see, uh, we have, I've already shown you the isoscape where you can get nice spatial differences and you can also uh, use this technique to look at how animals uh, are, how, what, where they are in the trophic, uh, which trophic level they lie at within their ecosystem. So it's got uh, both sort of trophic studies uh, and, and sort of spatial study. Um, capacity to, to be used as a tool in these these kind of uh, sort of re this kind of research, but um, effectively, just to summarise that, um, the concept really of, of stable isotopes at its core is you are what you eat, or you are where you eat. You're in you're both. So I hope you all you hope you're all with me. But effectively, we're we're using this these natural variations in space. Uh, to tell us a little bit about where the whale sharks are spending their time. So, um, for this study, and uh, just a reminder, we were doing it in, in Qatar, in Mafia, and in Tofu. So, yeah, Tanzania, and Tanzania, Qatar, and in Mozambique. So, those are our study sites. So, one of the first things we did to, uh, to, to be able to to, to look at these stable isotopes, we had to collect uh, small tissue samples uh, from uh, individual sharks. And we used uh, this sort of standard way of doing this is using a Hawaiian sling. It's just a, I guess it's a sort of hand spear fishing gadget, which we use with elastics on it. And it just takes a small, a small piece of skin from the dorsal side of the whale sharks. Um, we collected, we managed to collect samples from uh, several individuals and because of the uh, cost of analysis, which you know I mentioned that a satellite tag costs you about five grand, uh, to analyze a whale shark sample for stabilized analysis costs you more like 10, 10 bucks. So it means that we can uh, process quite a lot of samples from a lot of different individuals, which means we can get a really good look at what um, a lot of individuals in that population or that aggregation are doing rather than perhaps uh, you know just just a few which might be imposed by cost restraints of doing doing tagging work. So we collected a, a whole bunch of samples. I did a lot of lab work <laughs> and then once we got the results back uh, we got really really good separation between the three study sites. So this is what I was uh, hoping for, um, and I, for those who know a bit about sort of statistics and box plots, um, this may look like the box plots are overlapping quite a lot, but for isotope results, this uh, clearly shows three very, very separate uh, aggregations that we're looking at here. So, but I mean, the thing is, I've already mentioned that you can change you can get different results uh, looking at trophic level as well as space, as, as well as where the whale sharks are uh, geographically. So we had to just check um, and we had to compare the whale shark data to data of some local species to see how they matched up, if they were really from the local area or not, or maybe they were just eating something different. So 
this uh, this graph, the main, I guess the main takeaway from this graph is to see that we got a lot of tuna data, we got a lot of mackerel data, we got some barnacle data, and we put it all together, and we compared the whale sharks uh, to all of this data across this huge latitudinal gradient that we had across the three study sites. And we found that the whale sharks matched up really, really well with the, uh, with the local species that were found in those areas. So what we're seeing is in this uh, uh, box plot here is that these whale sharks really are spending time in completely different geographical areas. And uh, the areas are pretty much exactly where we see them during the aggregations, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, the time scale uh, that we're looking about this uh, is really over a few years. So the date, this data, based on um, the, the whale shark's metabolism and the tissue type and a few other things, means that these whale sharks are probably spending several years in and around the the areas that we're seeing them in. The, so they're sort of aggregation sites. Um, over over several over several years, over a few a few hundred kilometers perhaps, which is um, quite surprising. The whale sharks are extremely mobile animals. We've got return trips of whale sharks going, you know, uh, tens you know tens of kilometers uh, uh, back and forth to to study sites. Um, so this is quite quite surprising that really when they leave these uh, when they leave these study sites, they're really not. Um, they're really not going very far when they leave and they really are spending quite a lot of time in the areas that we find them in, which is uh, what I'll talk about later. It's quite important for management issues and when we come around to it, protecting them. So that's some, there were some pretty, pretty exciting results to see that these sharks were, despite the fact we maybe don't see them for half the year, they're actually pretty resident to the sites that we see them in. Um, but we did, we did want to have a little bit of an idea about maybe how, how connected they are. Like how much do we think that maybe these whale sharks are actually moving in between these sites? Maybe they're actually very, very, like they're in crab, very mobile and they switch between sites and we just don't know about it. Um, so we also looked at a lot of photo identification data. And I know you guys might be familiar with this as well. Um, Whale sharks were using another uh, sort of very natural, the very natural patterning that they have on their bodies. Um, they have this amazing spots and stripes pattern, which uh, much like the manta rays is completely unique. The manta ray belly spots and the whale shark uh, spots by their gills are completely unique to each individual, which means that we can take photographs of them. And this is effectively, every time we take a photograph of them, it's like a stamp in their passport. We know exactly where they are and where they've been. And every time we recite them, we know that they've uh, been in that place again. And if they move between study sites, we'll, we'll be able to tell if they turn up in one place and we see them in another, we'll take a photograph of them. And we'll be able to tell if there's a lot of movement between any of these sites. Um, just to note that uh, Mafia and Mafia Island at Tanzania and Tanzania and Tofa Beach and Mozambique, they are close enough, they are definitely close enough for it to be possible uh, for whale sharks to quite frequently move between these two places. So we were quite interested to see um, what, what kind of connectivity we were going to get and how many individuals we were going to see between these two. We, we weren't quite sure about Qatar, it's a lot further away, although it would be probably possible for the whale sharks to get there, we were expecting a lot less connectivity uh, from Qatar. Um, and without going into too much detail, we took a lot of photographs. So we took photographs of 4,179 encounters. So each time we saw a shark, we took a photograph. And that added up to um, 1,240 individual sharks identified. And, and that was across a time span of about 10 years. So this is a lot of data and a lot of swimming around in the water with whale sharks. Um, oh, that was much more fun than the analysis. Um, and really what that added up to is a very, very teeny tiny number where 0.2, sorry, yeah, 0.2% 
of those sharks were seen in more than one place, which really meant that there were actually two sharks that went between Tanzania and Mozambique in 10 years. Um, there was no other connectivity between those three study sites. We also ran a few models, which is the sort of bottom graph there, and we tried to figure out a little bit about the populations, how they might be structured, and it turns out that the residency uh, of the whale sharks is probably about the same as you get at other aggregation sites, but Tanzania was probably the most resident. The sharks spent a lot more time at Mafia Island than at, in Qatar, and then the sharks in Mozambique spent a little less time each time they were there in, in Mozambique. So probably a bit, the sharks are a little bit more mobile, they'll spend a little bit less time by the coast in Mozambique and in Tanzania. Um, they spent a lot of time there. And I think actually my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Rona, will be talking a bit about that in one of his talks, maybe next week or the week after, so you should definitely tune in for that. So what we ended up with is sort of biochemical data telling us that for at least three plus, five plus years, these whale sharks were spending a huge amount of their time, whether we could see them or not, really, really close to these coastal aggregation sites. So they are really resident uh, within a few hundred kilometers of these places. Um, and we show that there's very, very little connectivity, even from uh, study sites, which are very close to each other, where they could possibly go between these uh, aggregations very easily. Um, so for, for those of you who just quickly would like to read a little bit more detail for the nerds out there who just can't get enough of biochemistry, um, this is actually a paper. Um, but the main conclusions that we came to was that really there's very little connectivity across a huge time span. So like more than 10 years, uh, 10 years at least, there's very little connectivity between these study sites. And we've actually anecdotally found the same uh, we've actually looked at sharks, you know, from Madagascar, which is just across the Mozambican Channel from uh, from Tanzania and Mozambique. We have no sharks uh, that, are same, that are the same there. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there was also a, a global analysis of all the photo ID uh, of all the whale sharks in the world. And, and they, although there were occasionally individuals going between study sites that the number of them was extremely low so even though these sharks was could possibly move easily between all of these aggregation sites it seems they're very very uh resident or they're very philopatric to the areas that they spend their, their sort of time feeding but what that means actually is that regional conservation is going to be a very important tool for, for these places it means that really we're, we're likely if we implement local conservation measures and habitat habitat protection and species protection that that's going to have a, a really large impact on the sharks in that area um, we really although there should be global protections in in place it means that if there are particular issues in each of these study sites whether it be target fisheries whether it be boat strikes um, taking local initiatives will have a, a larger impact on that on that aggregation on that population than we might have thought before which is actually quite good news for conservation it means it's a lot easier to implement uh, very effective ways of keeping these guys safe um, I'm just going to end with a video just to wake you all up if this plays. Um, hopefully one day I will get to go back to do some field work. This is the kind of stuff we get to do when uh, the world isn't in a pandemic. Um, this is actually in Mafia in Tanzania, probably one of the best places to go see whale sharks if anybody is interested. Um, yes, we were supposed to go there in November, but uh, perhaps the whale sharks will be. Uh, just we know they'll be there we'll come back to them next year but this is the kind of uh, scenes that we get when we're on field work and uh it's just yeah and uh, i didn't see the whale shark coming towards me and i had to back off very very quickly <laughs> so that's what happened there um oh 
last one. So yeah, like I said, if you wanted to find a bit more information or if I don't get your questions or if you think of something tomorrow, um, you can totally get in touch with me and I can answer your, I'll happy to answer your questions at a later date. Um, if you just want to just look at pictures and don't need to know anything more about science, um, both myself um, on Instagram and, and Chris and Simon as well, if you find them as well, have lots of pretty well shot pictures. So feel free to um, <laughs> just uh, nerd out uh, on the photo gallery rather than on the paper. Um, so for now, I, oh good, I kept it to about 30 minutes. Um, I think for now I'm just gonna hand over, or hand back to Janae, and maybe we can uh, get to some questions if anybody has any. I will stop sharing. Hopefully that's worked. That's okay. Stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Well, thank nice. you so much. Um, we had a question from Edward. Um, he's watching. He's six years old. He wants to know how fast do whale sharks swim? Oh my gosh, children ask the best worst questions, um, honestly. Um, it's actually really hard to measure how fast they're going. Um, we think they can, I, we have no idea what their top speed is. I think when they're feeding pretty, with their mouths open, they go a lot slower because they've got a lot more force going against them. I think it's like three to six knots or something, or does that seem really, really fast when they're feeding? But we, we really don't have very many good measurements about uh, how fast they can swim. Um, I have seen them swim away very quickly when they get a shock from something, so I have a suspicion that they can swim extremely fast if they want to, but I don't think anyone's ever had a good measurement of that. I'm gonna have to get, this is a very good question, Edward, and you're gonna make me go and look this up now. And you've shamed me in front of everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and Edward, they, they have this huge back tail and uh, it enables them to go from moving really slow to faster than us, at least in the water, pretty quickly. So like Claire said, if, if the whale shark wants to book it away from you, a couple swishes of their huge tail and pretty soon they're out of sight. Uh, yes, that tail makes them extremely, and the, and the shape of their body and a few other things means them, they're very hydrodynamic and they are very, very efficient, very efficient swimmers for sure. Yeah. And then Eva wants to know if you know the maximum size of the fish that they can eat. So whale sharks are deceptive creatures. They've got very, very big mouths. So they, their mouth can get to about one, 1.2 meters wide. Um, but their throat is actually probably about the size of your fist. So the maximum size of fish, they do eat small fishes as well as, as plankton. But we're talking about between about 10 and 13 centimeters is the, the largest thing that they can eat. So really just uh, small bait fish is probably the biggest, the biggest animals they can, they can eat. I, I have been on, on trips with people and, and parents will ask me when we're on the boat, not beforehand, when we're on the boat, they're like, do, do, you, do you think the whale shark could eat my child? And I was like, well, firstly, this is something you should have asked me much earlier than this, but also no, unless your child is this big, you're, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Lynn wants to know if you take on interns in your research. Ah, uh, I wish. We don't even have, we don't even have research at the moment. So, um, generally we don't, because we're all over the world a lot of the time. Myself, Chris and Simon spend quite a lot of time moving around in a way. We do occasionally, uh, we do occasionally take, take interns. And in fact, actually, Janae, you're probably the better person to answer this question, to be honest. I'm just going to straight pass over to you. Okay, great. Um... The Marine Megafauna Foundation, um, we do take interns sometimes. We take them on kind of like a need base level. And so it's like a variety of skill sets. So sometimes people who are maybe in school, they're doing their master's or their PhD. Um, I volunteered with the Marine Megafauna outside of school completely. 
And with the research area, like if you're a diver and if you have maybe like modeling experience or basically a timing issue, if we have a project coming up that your skill set fits. So like I spoke with the Marine Megafauna Foundation for months before it like lined up correctly for me to be able to go and help them with the project. But we also take like social media interns. Um, uh, we work a lot with the community in Tofu Mozambique. And so basically www.marinemegafauna.org will have any sort of contact or additional information if you are interested in looking up. We're located in other areas other than just tofu, so definitely check it out um, and, and get in touch if you're interested. And of course, right now with COVID, we're not really doing anything with anybody. Everything's on pause, but hopefully it won't be that way for much longer, so. We all hope. We all hope. <laughs> I'm like hopefully but like realistically it's probably going to be a while but eventually maybe we can hook up with some potential interns uh let's see what kind of education did you follow okay so um i did most of my education in i'm english so i did most of it i just happened to do most of it in the uk so I did uh, an undergraduate degree at the University of Durham. It was pretty broad. It was just a zoology degree. I wasn't actually sure at that point whether I wanted to do marine or terrestrial biology and ecology. Um, I did a master's at Imperial College London, and that was also quite broad. It was called Ecology, Evolution and Conservation. Really, really broad. Same at this stage. I, just, I was just interested in everything. Um, and so I didn't really specialize until my PhD, really. I actually went out to Tofu in between my master's and my, and my PhD. Um, I was actually helping when I first arrived in 2011. I was actually helping out uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Rona, with his PhD when he was completing it. And then, uh, and then once he was sort of coming to the end of his PhD, I, I kind of put together a, a I guess, a, a plan. Or I, I mostly just asked Chris and Simon if they would support me if I started a PhD um, out there as well. And we put together, we put together a proposal. We kind of did it backwards. We kind of came up with the PhD first, and then backtracked for the university and, and the money. But I ended up at the University of Southampton working in the National Oceanography Center. Um, and I, I did my PhD there with my field work mostly based in, in Mozambique and, and in Tanzania. So that's kind of, and there was a bit of sort of volunteering here and there uh, scattered amongst the degrees, but that's mostly, uh, that's sort of mostly what I ended up doing. So yeah, I guess that's my education background. We've got this next question. Um... Dr. Claire, I'm very excited if you start uh, collaboratives with WTI's whale shark conservation program from the Arabian Sea. And it, can you reveal more details about your findings? Um, the Arabian Sea, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what's, I have to say, since, uh, so our collaborator, I think you might know, I was going to say savvy. Yeah, I think you might know we were working with um, uh, David Robinson and a whole bunch of people out there. And then there was the Arabian whale shark uh, uh, study. And then sort of basically the oil field changed hands and things got very, very complicated. So I'm not sure what the situation is out there at the moment, but it's actually... Uh, I mean, you should definitely email me, but, but mostly if you're interested in some collab collaborative work out in, in, in Qatar and in the, and the Arabian Sea, it's mostly actually Chris, like Dr. Chris Rona, that you'll have to get in touch with, mostly because he was, him and David Robin, Dr. David Robinson were heading up the work out there. So they are much more up to date with exactly what the uh, sort of conservation, financial and political situation is in the Arabian Sea kind of area. So. Um, yeah, I would love to, I, I mean, I would love to go back out there for sure. Um, but I would definitely be taking my lead from Chris as he's a bit more savvy in that, in that region. And I think that we're on schedule to do one of these talks with Chris, like one week from today. So yeah, I waiting. spoke to, yes, I spoke to Chris this morning. He's genuinely enthusiastic. In fact, he was bummed that he didn't get to do it before Steph did last week. He was just <laughs> like, what about me? So 
yeah, I think Chris is mostly going to be talking about, about Tanzania, but if you can't get hold of him privately, come back to this next week and you can, you can spam him in, in the chat again and ask him uh, a bit more about uh, working in like the Arabian kind of area. Great. And um, we've got back to connectivity. Can we have an average size of shark per aggregation? Djibouti is the smallest, I believe with the Galapagos at the largest? Can we, you know, this is such a big question. I'm, are you tracking along? I'm gonna like lose you because it's amazing. Can we track smallest to largest aggregations and would there be something to look at? Um, so yeah, each, each aggregation site has a, a different average size. Um, I think in, Tanzania and Mozambique were about at the five and a half, six level, and that's roughly where most aggregations are. You are right, in Djibouti they're slightly smaller. I think the average size is near a five or just under five. Um, the Galapagos, as you mentioned, and is a very weird and special place. So all of the sites that I've mentioned here, and most of the ones in the Western Indian Ocean and Mexico, for example, are, you know, depending on the aggregation, they are like 60 to 80% juvenile males, and they're all roughly in the size region of like five to seven, five to eight meters. Galapagos is the complete opposite. It's one of the only, it is the only aggregation in the world where you're pretty much going to get like 90% females, and they are all enormous. None of them are really below about 10 meters. So you're looking at the sort of 10 to 30 meter females, and these women are behemoths. They look completely different they look like giant torpedoes and they're absolutely amazing and you're quite right we are focusing quite a lot of um, energy and effort into the Galapagos I think there's a collaborative project there MMF are part of that project um, and I think they're along with the Georgia Aquarium and sort of shark ship research groups in the Galapagos and a few other groups is a massive collaborative effort to work in the Galapagos to find out um, well, we were hoping a lot of a lot more things about breeding and reproduction because we are kind of assuming that these are giant breeding females. Um, there's a couple of other exciting places. Um, Qatar, for example, actually is slightly interesting in that the sex ratio is slightly nearer 50-50, but not quite, still mostly males. And we do get slightly larger sharks out there as well. It's a lot more sort of seven to eight, nine meter sharks there, but still slightly more mature individuals. But um, yeah, they, there definitely is difference in in the size and uh, and sort of sex skew between these places, but most of them are juvenile males between like five to seven meters. Um, the connectivity stuff, yeah, because there's so few places like Galapagos and another one would be St. Helena in the Atlantic, there's so few places where we get something different um, that we're, we are focusing a lot of energy and effort in these special places, but we still haven't really seen very much connectivity even between those, those study sites. But um, yeah, if you're particularly interested in the Galapagos, there's quite a lot of uh, research already out on that about their movements. I'm not gonna go into it now because it's quite a lot of it, but, but yeah, there's, there's, yeah. So, oh, there's so, you're saying if there's, is, if there's something to look at there, there's so many things to look at. I could, yeah, I could write a thesis just on the stuff we don't know. Um, at, at this point in time. I hope that was kind of a helpful answer though. Yeah, and Savvy also says, uh, it was fun to tag and ID some sharks with you in Qatar for the fourth International Whale Shark Conference. So I'm very jealous that you guys got to do that together. <laughs> and also yeah. asked, with slow growth, do you think that there's gonna be more connectivity as your data set gets larger through the years? Um, I don't know if there will be more connectivity because what we have noticed is that the the the, the I, like we, we kind of suspect they, they do grow extremely slowly but we think this the, the top out sizes that we see at these coast aggregation sites are we think quite connected with sexual maturity so the reason we don't really see larger sharks at most of these places is we we think that once they reach maturity um they they basically move offshore um they you know maybe they, they're just changing when they're younger when they're juveniles they're really what they're trying to do is eat a lot grow quickly and survive uh, once you reach sexual maturity there are other things that are important to you and that 
comes with a very significant habitat shift. And we, we know that it happens because we know that we don't see large adults any of these places. So we know that they're spending their time elsewhere. Um, so I, I think even though we, we might see different individuals, as in younger ones will start to arrive and maybe like older, larger ones will start to maybe not see them so much, I don't think the connectivity will go up. I think for that size and age class, this is just part of their, part of their behavior to be honest, but um, I'm hoping over time um, we, will, we will still find out more about what the adults are doing uh, once they leave, but uh, it's, it's very hard when you don't know where they are and can't find them, you, you can't put tags on them to, to find out where they are and tag them, and the ocean is a very big place, so we're, we're trying to work on it, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a catch-22 at the moment for most of us. <laughs> Andy asks if there's any particular threats to the whale sharks in the aggregation areas that need to be addressed and has work been started? <clears throat> so um, it, it, it happens that actually, d depending on which aggregation you're looking at, the, the threats are actually quite uh, individual to that area. So for Mozambique, for example, um, sort of gillnet fishing. So there's a lot of really big gillnets that get set perpendicular to the shore, which uh, doesn't only, uh, you know, it sort of upsets whale sharks. And although we don't get that many, uh, that many reports of whale sharks, quite a lot of the coastline in Mozambique is uninhabited, so we don't know. But these gillnets also catch manta rays. They catch other rays. They catch other sharks um, indiscriminate, indiscriminately. And um, so this is one of the things that we're trying to work with. So in Mozambique, it would be usually working with uh, uh, sort of local fisheries to try and use alternative gear, um, help them increase their catch to the to the game fish, which is what they want, and help reduce catch of elasmobranchs, which is what we want. In Tanzania, it's a bit different. They have a ring ring net fishery there, which operates during the day and at night. And quite a lot of the work we're trying to do there is to work with the ring net fishery. Um, because they purposely trap the nets around the whale sharks because the whale sharks associate with quite a lot of the bait fish uh, that, that they, the fisheries want, want to catch. Both uh, and the whale sharks actually want to eat them as well. They do have a bit of a bit of a symbiotic relationship there as well, but you know there are accidents which happen at night and net entanglements. Um, in Qatar, actually tail roping is a problem uh, where they, instead of letting the sharks out fishing nets, they'll actually put a rope around their tail and drag them out, which often uh, can end in death or sort of dismemberment. In Mexico, there's a really big shipping lane that goes straight through the aggregation, so each area really does have quite specific threats. Um, and it's, it's a good bad, it's a good bad thing because, like I said, because of the sort of lack of connectivity in a lot of these places, it means we really can address regional, regional threats and know that we're going to have an impact on the population. Um, but yeah, and, and, but each country will have their issues about how they solve, solve these problems. Um, and in Mozambique, we have sort of been working with the, working with the local fisheries to try and do gear exchanges and things like that. And in Tanzania, um, uh, sort of MMF and the sort of other local partners have a really good relationship with the fishermen. So that in each place, I guess we're definitely at different stages of dealing with these issues. We're in different stages of research in a lot of these places as well, but there are efforts once these threats, regional threats are identified that there, there is work being done to try and um, sort of figure out how to, how to sort of manage, manage these problems. But uh, yeah, definitely on different timescales and uh, different levels of difficulty to, <laughs> to deal with these problems at the moment. Roz asks, what's next for your research? What's the next question that you want to answer? So, um, I think you're going to regret asking me this now, actually, because <laughs> there's, um, I'm actually writing up some of the uh, other research that I've done as well. It's not published yet, but I'm just working on it now. There's actually another type of biochemical technique called fatty acid analysis, which um, looks a bit more, it's definitely a bit more you are what you eat rather than you are where you eat. Um, but it's going to help me look at a li little bit more about their, about their diet and exactly where they're spending their time and where they're feeding. Um, because, so, you know, a lot of the tags and stabilized strips kind of tells you where they're going. This tells you a little bit more about where they're eating and what habitats are very important to them. I mean, for example, we know that whale sharks can dive very, very deep. I think some of the 
maximum depths we've got now are like 1.9 kilometers at the moment. So we know they dive very, very deep. So, you know, is this a navigational tool? Are they, what are they doing down there? Can we, do we have any evidence that maybe they're feeding at these depths? Um, are, they, are, they, are they deep sea feeders? Uh, we, we don't know. And so the other biochemical techniques will help us untangle a little bit more about which habitats they're spending time in and, and which, which areas are important to them. So that, that's kind of the next step, is using different techniques to slightly untangle um, how and where they're, they're spending their time to, to complement all of the work that I've kind of talked about now and all of the tagging work that we've done um, previously. So yeah, that's, that's my next step is uh, finish, finish the work I'm working on right now. Sam says that your talk was awesome and is wondering if there's any indication that climate change can increasingly impact whale sharks ranges, maybe affecting the quantity and distribution of food, and that presumably this would need to be considered when you're doing conservation and management plans. Yeah, so I mean we, I think we as a research community, I as far as I know, nobody has reported any significant and directional uh, sort of regional shifts. Um, a lot of places have recorded, you know, decreases in sightings and population numbers over the last decade as well. But that is uh, probably more connected to uh, sort of th threats than it is to climate change. Um, I, but I, I think it would be uh, short-sighted to assume that they, just because we haven't noticed it yet, that it won't happen. Whale sharks are, you know, they're planktivores. They're kind of slightly lower on the food chain. They're going to be much more sensitive to any, uh, any how, how climate changes, how climate change affects the location and quantity and quality of zooplankton and plankton. In, in the ocean. So I, yeah, I, I would expect over time that as, you know, perhaps temperature changes, whale sharks do prefer to stay in certain sort of uh, certain temperature zones. They're, they're quite tolerant, but they, they do prefer certain temperatures. So as water temperature changes, as potentially ocean currents change and productivity shifts, um, I would expect them to respond in kind to that, but we just, uh, we, we haven't quite seen evidence of it yet. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what time scale the whale sharks are working on, but um, yeah, so I, I would say, yes, we probably would expect this kind of thing to happen, but um, I don't know how long it's gonna take and we haven't really seen any really good evidence that it's, it's happened yet. Another question, how can we cooperate with your foundation for whale shark monitoring in the Egyptian seas? So who is working in Egypt? I can't remember. Well, the best thing, the, the best thing to do uh, if you're in an area where you have whale sharks and, um, you know, if you don't have an, if there's no organization there or you don't have a local organization you can work with and you see whale sharks in the water, what I would say is, please buy an underwater camera. That would be great. Um, because, you know, I mentioned the, the data we were using, where we took a photograph of the spots on, on the whale shark side. Much, again, much like Manta's, uh, one of the really great things is that there's a citizen science platform uh, called whaleshark.org, or it's part of the Wild Me, sort of Wild Me umbrella. And anybody can upload photographs of whale sharks. Uh, you just put your email address in there, you upload your photos or video, whatever you've got, and they will get processed by whoever's responsible for that region. And that will get integrated into the data that we use to do exactly the kind of thing that I've just been talking about. Um, the data, I really encourage people to do it. Um, there's also information on there about like how to take a good photo, and the kind of thing that they're looking for um, but basically go for the left side always go for the left to the left to the left and um yeah if you don't have an underwater camera and you see them often enough get one it would be it would be amazingly helpful so i guess if you really see whale sharks that would be 
best way that you could collaborate. Otherwise, uh, yeah, otherwise you could get in touch with the nearest um, research organization that, that deals with that region, whoever that would be. I'm not really sure who that is in Egypt and the Red Sea, to be honest. Yeah, and even if you were a diver and you saw whale sharks like a couple of years ago, you can still upload all those old photos if you feel like geeking out a bit on, on yeah. the whale shark site. Exactly, exactly. If you're a complete technophobe, though, you can email it to one of us if you really can't work it out. But um, the, the, the website is, is very, very good and they've made it a lot more user friendly in the last few years. So, yeah, I, the, the cool thing about it as well is it's once you upload a photo, you put your email address in there. Once that shark gets identified, you'll get an email telling you who it is. And then every time they're seen again by anybody, you'll get an email saying, your shark was seen again, which is which is actually pretty cool. So you kind of sort of semi-adopted a shark without really meaning to. So I'd really encourage everybody to get involved if you can. Once we're all allowed back in the water, obviously. Eva asks, uh, are you married to whale sharks? Or are there any other marine species that you would be interested in researching? Um, I kind of accidentally fell into whale sharks. I love them dearly, but um, I do. There is a little bit of the, there is a little bit of work that I'm also have to get done on on billfish. So like marlin and sailfish, there is a sort of there is a project that I'm working on to do with them as well. Um, I would be totally open to working on any any species that would be helpful. Um, I probably have to stick to biochemistry because that's now what I'm, <laughs> that's now what I'm trained to do. I don't think I could uh, go out and analyze tag data, but um, yeah, I feel like this is the biochemistry, uh, the stabilized dopes and uh, from the previous question I mentioned, the fatty acid analysis. I think it's a really flexible tool and you can use it to answer quite a few interesting movement and feeding ecology and trophic ecology questions. So yeah, if something came up and it was about turtles or like manatees or like mobulas or whatever it was, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd definitely be interested in, in branching out to other species for sure. Jumping down the list a bit, just I see that Stan um, did a little tip going back to the whale shark ID and he just says uh, even posting to YouTube or social media, probably if you hashtag it whale shark or something, would be helpful because there's people out there who are searching for those videos and markers to take those ID shots off your, off your hands. So basically uploading your photos is, is super helpful. It's really like hitting that hard on the head right now. Um, be great. I mean, if, yeah, I would say that if you have the time, please just do it straight to whaleshark.org um, yeah. because it, it does take people a considerable amount of energy and time to troll through the internet. I know I've had to do that job back in the day, so I would say from my uh, research assistant self 10 no. years ago. That You're like, please God, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely directly email it to somebody who you know works in that area or, <laughs> or just just put it straight on the website. It'll take you the same amount of time to put it on the website as it will to probably post it to social media. So just throw it, throw it on whaleshark.org. It's super easy. We have a question from Nilza. The Nilza? The Nilza. Aww. <laughs> she says, she's curious to know if you've seen pathologies in whale sharks during your study period, and if there's an explanation to support the philopatry of whale sharks and their lack of connectivity within the Western Indian Ocean area? Ah, oh, Niels, that's just a hard question. <laughs> um, we, so we know, I guess, I guess summarizing is that we, we kind of know that they do this now, um, but we're really not sure why they do this. The only thing I would think of just, I guess, rationalizing is that, um, like I said, the, the sort of younger juvenile sharks, um, their, their main aim of their life at that point in time is to eat a lot, grow a lot and survive. And like I said in the talk as well, like the tropical ocean is, is basically a food desert for them. And I, I feel like once they have found a reliable source of food, even if it is seasonal, it, it would make sense that they would uh, keep coming back to that place for reliable food um, and that perhaps they would be less inclined to travel further away because as they go further away, you know, the risk of, you know, not finding anything uh, is, it, I, get, I guess, gets a bit greater. Um, 
yeah, I, I'm really not sure exactly, you know, because we, we don't have very much information about their life, you know, before about four meters, they're, when before they're about the size of other predatory sharks in coastal areas, we know very, very little about their life, just as much as we don't know very much about their life once they are mature. Um, so the only thing I can think of is to say that they kind of want to conserve as much energy as they can while stuffing their face. And it seems to be that the, you know, maybe not going so far away from the areas that they know um, is probably a good strategy. Um, a, a, colleague of, a colleague of ours, uh, also MMF Alex, is looking into the genetics of all of these different aggregations. And we're trying to see maybe if there's some reason why certain whale sharks go to certain areas or stay in certain areas. Like maybe they're all kind of related and that's why, you know, they go to that place and not somewhere else. You know, kind of like, I guess, nesting turtles will home back to certain, certain regions and certain beaches and things. You know, we're trying to figure out exactly why certain whale sharks stay in certain areas, but we're not quite there yet. We're just at the point where we, we, we kind of know that they're, they're pretty, pretty, pretty regional once, once they're at, you know, four, four or five meters. They do hang out in that area, um, more or less, until they get to about eight or nine meters and then to go somewhere else so it's yeah yeah hard question we're, we're working on it is probably the answer <laughs> probably the answer to that and you kind of hit on this next question um they're asking if if you think there's genetic connectivity between those different aggregations or not yeah so not a geneticist so i'm going to do broad strokes answer to this and maybe like alex will come on one day and do do the genetics spiel which will be really interesting um the broad strokes thing is that in the Western Indian Ocean, of all the uh, aggregations, all the way from the Western Western Australia, you know the ones in, that they see in Indonesia, all the way to the ones they see in Mozambique, um, at a certain sort of level of uh, depending on what you know genes and genetics you're looking at, there is it's completely ho genetically homogeneous population. Uh, there is there is a slight difference between the Indian Ocean sharks and the Atlantic Ocean sharks. So we think that there hasn't been a lot of uh, breeding for quite a long time between the Atlantic and sort of Indian Ocean Pacific populations. So those two have a bit of a genetic separation, um, but within the Indian Ocean, it's almost completely homogenous. So there there are enough individuals breeding between those sites, um, at least one per lifetime, I think it is, to keep that completely homogenous. Um, what Alex is looking into is slightly more detailed, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to say detail because I <laughs> definitely don't know much more about it, but she's starting to look at things um, a bit more like sort of siblings and half siblings kind of uh, uh, kind of relationships. So much more detailed uh, interconnectivity between all of these aggregation sites to see if we are you know, we're, we're looking too big and maybe there are slightly more subtle connections between or, or separations between all these different sites, um, looking at different genes and SNPs and things I don't un understand. Um, interesting though, I do know that they're, they're in the Tanzania aggregation, I know that there are two half siblings in that aggregation. So at least there's two sharks in Tanzania that are kind of uh, have the same, I think have the same mother or the same father, which is quite interesting. So yeah, Alex is just finishing up her PhD at the moment, and I think she's writing a paper right now as well. So I'm really excited to see the kind of data she comes out with because it will start to answer some of these more detailed uh, questions. That'll be super cool. It's going to be super cool. Yeah. Let's see. A couple more questions. Do you predict a fair, uh, a great amount of residency then? So I can say that again. So it blipped out there a bit, Jenny. Would you predict a great amount of residency for this? Uh, uh, oh, in Oslob. Um, I, I think that they probably, sh I know that they did. So when I, when I won one of those slides and I said, we did a bunch of modeling. Uh, so actually the guys in Lamave who did the same kind of modeling over there, they actually had a very, they come up with, came up with a very, very similar population model and a very similar residency number to, I think to the sharks, I think somewhere between the sharks in Qatar and, and Mozambique. So they, they do show a reasonable amount of residency. Um, and I know in the Philippines, they do have some connectivity between the two or three sites that they have in the Philippines. There is a bit of connectivity within the Philippines. 
but I don't think there's that much con connectivity outside uh, that general area. Um, yeah, not not my not my. Uh, I don't. I yeah, other than sort of vaguely knowing the guys from La Mave who do the research out there, my knowledge of specifically Oslob is is very also broad strokes. I'm not really doing myself any favors here, am I? Mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine they they have interestingly they have reported um, an increase in residency time. Uh, so a lot of the sharks are spending. I, I don't know if they have very much before they were doing the provisioning data, but I know that. Though they do have a lot of sharks, which are who are staying in the Oslob area for. I think there's one shark that that stayed there over a year, uh, when normally they would stay there for. You know, I think it's like 20, 20 or thirty days, and then they'd leave and maybe come back again later. So the the the, the feeding is definitely affecting their behaviour, but I think they they're going to have to do a few more years worth of data collection to actually get some good figures on how much it's affecting their behavior. Um, so yeah, the answer is for some sharks, yeah, it will be definitely be affecting their residency, um, at, at least uh, and definitely affecting their behavior. Okay. I got, I'm just gonna explain a little bit, I guess. I got a little bit lost in that question, but then I caught up. So this is just talking about the kind of like tourism operations that do actually put feed into the water to attract the whale sharks and the question that was <laughs> established like whale sharks behavior changing for residency. Yeah. 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 So yeah, Oslob is a, yeah, a very, I guess a very unique uh, aggregation site as in the, the way that the tourism is set up there is that it's very very close to shore and there's a lot of what we call provisioning that goes on there so the tour operators will actually put this uh, I think it's like I just call it shrimp paste in the water which the whale sharks absolutely love and it will keep the whale sharks near the boats and near the tourists and it will keep the whale sharks in that general area because they're, they're getting fed and yeah, the question was, does that affect their behavior? And, and we, we know that it does, um, but, uh, I, but I think the researchers there have been operating there for about eight or nine years so far, and they do have quite a lot of, quite a lot of good data. And we know at least for certain in individuals where the average time that they would spend there, maybe like 20 or 30 days, I can't remember the exact number, they do have some sharks that will stay there for over a year, like without leaving. So um, it, it has definitely affected their behavior for sure. Okay, that's the end of our questions and everyone's saying thank you and they really enjoyed your talk. Um, you answered a ton of questions, that was amazing. Uh, <laughs> because Nilza like echoes me, I'm gonna just read. She says she's always impressed and inspired by you and every time she hears you talk, she just can't get enough of it and I'm the same, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Virginia, for hosting this. It's really kind of you. And thanks, everybody, for turning up. I know Friday nights aren't exactly what they used to be, for sure, but still, I do appreciate everybody uh, turning up for a, for a webinar instead of socially distancing the pub. So uh, thank you. Well, at least in the UK. Maybe, like, it, this would be weird day drinking in the States, so wherever you are. It happens. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, stay safe. And if you want to tune in next week, we're going to have another super geeky, awesome whale shark talk. So stay okay. safe. Thank you all. Stay safe. See you Thanks. next time, everyone. Bye.